link. Hello and welcome to the first part of our um, 2021 Bind 9 security webinar series. Today we talk about SA Linux, uh, especially SA Linux on Red Hat based Linux distributions. So what do we have in this webinar? We will talk about Linux security modules. Uh, we will cover what is SA Linux and how SA Linux works on files and processes. Now, SA Linux is infamous for creating all kinds of problems that administrators don't like. So I would like to demystify some of this and show you how to, you can fix the um, file permission issues that might uh, show up with bind or port and socket permission issues. We will learn about the SA Linux Boolean switches and how we can do troubleshooting with SA Linux. And at the end, we have a half an hour hands-on lab where you can choose from up to three different sessions where you can uh, test out SA Linux and how to solve issues with SA Linux. So let's look into Linux system, Linux security modules or LSMs. So these LSMs are extensions to the Linux kernel and uh, the Linux kernel itself has interfaces in which the Linux security modules can hook into. And these interfaces are available for syscalls, for file accesses, for process creation, for namespaces and C groups, and for user identity and for some other stuff as well. Um, so an LSM module that is loaded will plug into one or more of these interfaces. And if an application, a user space application, such as the bind9 name server, tries to use a kernel function, a syscall or something similar, then the LSM becomes active and will be asked whether the application is allowed or disallowed to use that kernel function based on the rules of the LSM policy. I have here a link to a blog post um, that describes the Linux security module infrastructure. And I have also the full URL in the resources page afterwards. We distinguish major LSMs um, that are implementing what's called a mandatory access control. And of the major LSMs, only one of these Linux security modules can be enabled at any given time. Uh, major LSMs are SA Linux, which we cover this time, AppArmor, Smack, and Tomoyo, which we will cover in the next webinar. And besides the major LSMs, there are a couple of minor LSMs. And the minor LSMs can be activated in addition to the major LSMs and also in addition to other minor LSMs. And we will cover some of these, but not all of these in one of the following webinars. If you want to know which Linux security modules are available in your Linux system, you can look into slash sys slash kernel slash security slash LSM. And that will print out the LSMs that are available and or active in your system. So in this example here, the lockdown minor, minor LSM, capability minor LSM, Yama LSM, and Tomoyo and BPF LSMs were active. This webinar is about SA Linux. So what exactly is SA Linux? SA Linux for, oh, a typo there, security enhanced Linux is a Linux security module that implements mandatory access control. It was originally developed by the United States National Security Agency or NSA and found its way into the mainline Linux kernel in 2003 with Linux version 2.6.0. SO Linux consists of two major parts. There is the kernel code and the user space utilities to maintain SA Linux. And these kernel code and the utilities are generic and they are available on many different Linux systems. And then there are the SE Linux policy files. And the policy files need to be adapted for each Linux distribution to work and to be useful. And there is where the different Linux systems really, really differ. We come to that differences in a moment. So what is actually a mandatory access control? 
Traditionally, Unix and Linux systems implement something that is called discretionary access control or DAC. DAC is implemented using the Unix file permissions, which are read, write, and execute for the owner of a file, the group owner, and the rest of the world. And you all know that, uh, you all probably have seen the RWX um, access permission bits on a directory listing in a Unix system, which are highlighted here on the SRC directory. And especially with DAC, the owner of a file or directory can change these permissions. In contrast to DAC, we have MAC or mandatory access control. And SA Linux enables this mandatory access control. And mandatory access control is now enabled in addition to the old discretory access control in the Linux system. SA Linux mandatory access control has higher preference than the DAC, meaning if SA Linux disallows some access, then even if it is allowed on the DAC system, it is still forbidden. In addition to file accesses, which are controlled by DAC, SA Linux also can control uh, access to network sockets, processes, namespaces, user and group IDs, and system calls, which normally are not being controlled by the DAC. In order to get access to an object, which can be a file, can be a directory, or can be a process or a socket, it must be permitted by both the mandatory access control and the discretory access control. Why should we want to use SA Linux? Now, SA Linux allows us to define a fine grained policy for processes. So, processes are not able to access any files or make changes to other processes outside these rules. Especially, SA Linux can prevent privilege escalation through security vulnerabilities in software. So either that the bind nine process is accessing file that do not belong to the bind nine configuration, or that other, other SA Linux confined software will access the bind nine files. SA Linux prevents both of these sec uh, security issues. This is done by having a modular security policy. And the security policy of SA Linux is independent of the Unix and Linux file permissions. The policy is enforced by the Linux kernel by the use of the SA Linux kernel module, mo module loaded into the kernel. And applications that violate the policy will be denied access. SA Linux can be deployed in two different modes. We know the full mode, and in a full mode, all files with no exception, all users, and also all processes must be subject to the SA Linux policy. Running a Linux system in full mode is a lot of policy work. And it's so much work that even the big Linux distributions don't support the full mode. Um, I've never seen myself uh, uh, a Linux system that run under full mode as a Linux. I've just heard some rumors that somewhere in dark corners in the internet, there might be some systems that run in full mode, but I never have seen them myself. Uh, what I usually work with is targeted mode. And in targeted mode, only selected files, selected users, and selected processes are under control of the SA Linux policy. All other objects are unconfined meaning that only the normal Unix permission apply. SA Linux also has other functions other than the mandatory access control. It also implements multi-level security where we can create up to 1024 security levels for the users. And then users of a lower level cannot access content created by users on a higher level. Now this is being used to create hierarchies very similar that we found in the military. That is not what we're talking about today. And it's usually not supported by the Linux distributions. 
And there's also a role-based access control system where users can gain extra privileges by switching roles in the system. So the root user, um, even as being root, doesn't have full control over the system as being root. Instead, the root user needs to change into the webmaster role to be able to make changes to the web server configuration, or the root user must change into the database uh, uh, administrator role to make changes to the database. Now, we don't discuss this SA Linux features in this webinar because they are not part of the Bind 9 SA Linux policy. So I already mentioned that the SA Linux policy needs to be adapted for each Linux distribution. And the different Linux distribution have varying support for SA Linux. I find that the best support for SA Linux can be found in Red Hat Enterprise Linux and uh, distributions that descend from Red Hat. So CentOS, Fedora, Alma Linux, Rocky Linux, they all have the same target policy, which come, originally comes from Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And Red Hat is really investing a lot of money in keeping the policy up to date and being targeted for all relevant processes in a Red Hat system. So the Ubuntu and Debian all have a basic target policy. So they uh, secure some basic parts of the operating system, but not as much as Red Hat and the Red Hat uh, family of operating systems. And for Arch Linux, as the Linux policies are currently work in progress, uh, they are based on what's called the reference policy. Uh, so some parts of Arch Linux can currently be secured by SA Linux, but not many. And you need to be aware that you might need to invest some work into the policy in order to make it uh, work. So this is the reason why I tend to use um, Red Hat based operating systems whenever there is a need for SA Linux. The command SE status gives us a broad overview over the SA Linux status in our system. There we can see whether SA Linux is enabled and in uh, which mode it is currently is in. We will cover the SA Linux modes in a moment. And we also see the policy name and we see that uh, SA Linux here is being loaded uh, or has loaded the so-called targeted uh, policy which is securing certain applications on the system. If we need to um, SA Linux, if we need to disable SA Linux, we need to know that SA Linux can be in three different modes. It can be completely disabled. If it is disabled, the SA Linux modules and policies are not loaded and are not enforced. And also, SA Linux file labels are not being created on any new files. Then SA Linux can be run in the what's called the permissive mode. In permissive mode, the modules and policies are loaded, but they are not enforced. Policy violations will be locked through the audit subsystem, but the processes are not being denied access to anything that violates the policy. New labels, uh, sorry, new files and new processes will get their SA Linux label. And then we have the enforcing uh, mode, which is where we aim to be, which is the um, SA Linux system is fully loaded, the policy is enforced. Meaning that if any process steps over the boundaries of the policy, the SA Linux module will um, deny the access to that um, object. So SA Linux is a very important security part of a Linux system. And you should not switch off SA Linux whenever you encounter an issue. Instead, try to fix these issues without disabling SA Linux. And I hope I give you some pointers in this webinar, how you can find the root cause of the issue and how you can help yourself to make SA Linux work with the 
uh, applications you want to run on your Linux system without turning it off. So on current Red Hat Enterprise Linux systems, which is Enterprise Linux 8, and also on the older systems, we can disable and enable as a Linux on the fly as the administrator, as a root user. We can do that with the command set enforce one uh, sets as a Linux in the enforcing mode and set enforce zero with, will set as a Linux in the permissive mode. So it basically turns as a Linux security off. The current Fedora Linux version 34, which is often being used as the template for the next Red Hat Enterprise Linux version, um, currently um, has made a, a change so that you can't change the SA Linux mode in a running system anymore. You have to go through a reboot to um, change the uh, SA Linux status. And that is actually a good thing because you don't want any intruder that gains root access on your system be able to disable SA Linux security. On the kernel command line, SA Linux can be controlled with the SA Linux parameter and an SA Linux equals zero will disable SA Linux completely, but that requires a reboot. And this is how you can disable SA Linux in the future and in Fedora 34. You can also switch uh, the different SA Linux modes being disabled, enforcing and permissive in the file etc SA Linux config. Now SA Linux is modular. So different modules for different applications can be loaded or unloaded by an administrator. The Red Hat based systems come with an extra SA Linux module for bind nine. With SA module minus L on the command line as being the root user, we can list all the available modules that are in our SA Linux system. And here we see there is a bind module available. And by default, that module is loaded and is being active. If we just want to disable a module for a certain application, we can do so with SA module minus D and then the name of the module. This will, will disable the SA Linux module until the next reboot. You can also enable a module on the command line with SA module minus E for enable and the minus V here just increases the verbosity mode. Now, it is really helpful to have the SA Linux man pages, the manual pages installed on the system. Unfortunately, Red Hat and CentOS systems don't install these man pages by default. You can add them from the SA Linux policy sources. You need to install SA Linux policy devel, which unfortunately has quite a large amount of dependencies. So I won't recommend that on all production systems, but it is good to have the man pages on the administrator's uh, workstation. And then the command SA policy man page minus A minus P, and then the path to the man pages will create all the different uh, man pages for the system. A little bit confusingly, while the module for bind is called bind, the man page is called named underscore SA Linux. The man page is automatically generated, so it's not written by a human. It's automatically created from the policy itself, but as, as far as automatic generated man pages goes, it, it can be readable and it can uh, reveal some in, in, interesting and important information. Um, interestingly, besides the by nine name server, uh, the man page also covers the unbound resolver because the unbound resolver is also being secured by the very same bind policy. So how does SA Linux work on a system? 
SA Linux controls access to files through what's called SA Linux context file labels. And the file label is stored in extended attributes on the file system. So SA Linux can only secure files that are stored on a file system that supports extended attributes. So it's not possible to reuse SA Linux on a FAT file system or on some of the network file systems like Samba. We have different kind of file types, SA Linux file types that is, for the bind files. There is the label named the underscore conf underscore t uh, for all the configuration files. Depending on a SA Linux variable, the bind process can either write the configuration files or it cannot write the configuration files. In a Red Hat system, by default, write access to the configuration files is allowed. On a Debian and Ubuntu system, when SA Linux is enabled, write access to the SA Linux, uh, uh, to the bind configuration files is not allowed. We have, in addition to the config, uh, bind config files, we have uh, files of type etsy underscore t, uh, which are generic Linux configuration files, and the name the root key is of that type because it's not technically a bind configuration file. And then in addition to the um, configuration files, we have the zone files. And there we have named the uh, underscore zone underscore T. And by default, the bind nine processes can read and write these files. And we have a switch called named the write master zones, which we will discuss below, where we can switch that um, write access to the zone files to off. And then we have dynamic files, which are of type named the underscore cache T, which are files that need to be read and written by the bind nine processes. Examples are the named the dot run file, the debug file, or the manage keys dot bind and manage keys dot bind dot journal file. We can make the security labels on a file visible with the ls command and the parameter minus uppercase Z or that. That ls command will list the SA Linux security label in addition to the uh, Unix file permissions. And the important part for, for us as administrators is the type, the file type, which we see as the uh, third uh, object in the um, SA Linux file label. So here for namedy.run, it's namedy underscore cache underscore t. We will find similar labels on the processes. If we list all the processes in the Linux system and also supply the parameter uppercase Z to the PS command, we'll see that the named process is of type system U. So it's running under the system user, which is the SA Linux user. It has a system role and it is of named underscore type. So it's a process that belongs to name D. The policy now describes um, which files the processes that run under name underscore T are allowed to access. Should the SL Linux module be not active, uh, then if we list the processes, we will see that the process is unlabeled. And if we see unlabeled processes, that's an indication that the SA Linux system has been disabled. And if we install our own bind binaries that we compile from source, and we install them on a non-default directory structure, like it is done here on our opt bind sbin named D, then when SA Linux is enabled, uh, 
the process is still unconfined T because the SE Linux policy can't map that file name to any of the processes that should be confined, should be restricted by the SE Linux policy. Whenever we run a process as unconfined, or if we run processes in a system where SA Linux is disabled, it will create new files without any security label. And that can be a problem if we then later switch on SA Linux again. If you switch off SA Linux for a certain amount of time and you have applications running while SA Linux is switched off, you have to relabel the whole operating or the whole file system to make sure that all the labels are correct again. Which brings us to the SA Linux troubleshooting. Violations against the SA Linux policy are locked using the Linux audit subsystem. And the command our search can be used to list the policy violation by a specific process. You see here the command line that I usually recommend to filter through the uh, audit logs. The command is our search, the parameter minus M AVC uh, will select all the uh, security uh, module policy violations. The parameter minus X selects the process name, uh, the file on the disk that created the process where we will filter on. And here it's user has been named D, which is the main bind process. And minus I for interpret prints the data in human readable form. So for example, you get the timestamps as human readable dates and times instead of seconds since the 1st of January, 1970. And here we see that access has been denied. There was a permission denied um, result from a system call. And denied was here the name the punct, uh, so the named the name bind function, which is a way of a process to open a socket. So here bind tried to open a socket to listen on either TCP or UDP, and that was outside the policy. So the um, SA Linux policy denied access to that port. And we see here it was port 853, which is the uh, statistics port. And the process was the ISC worker 000, that is the threat number. And the process ID was uh, 111, 615. So the audit subsystem log files give us detailed information what is, what is going wrong which processes create the violations and which system calls, which port numbers, which files are being tried to access and which are being denied. Very often the problem is that we have a file type label mismatch. If the file like the zone or configuration files have the file labels not correct, then as a Linux will prevent the bind nine process from being able to access these files. There can be many reasons for wrong or missing file labels. One is that the Linux system might have been run without SA Linux enabled, or that the files have been located in a non-default directory, for example, not in slash Etsy or not in var named D, or the files have been created in a non-default directory maybe the home directory of the administrative user, and then have been moved into the correct directory. However, moving a file in the same file system is just a rename operation and will not change the metadata on the file, including the file labels. We can use the command match path con, which is much match path context that will report the file label that does not match the SA Linux policy. It will also tell us about the ex expected file labels. So here I'm used much path con minus uppercase V for verbose on the file var namedy namedy.localhost. 
And it tells me that that file has the file label system u object r at c underscore t, but it should be system u object r named the zone t. So clearly here is a file system label mismatch. We can change the file label with the change context command chcon, where we um, specify the, uh, default, the, the target type with dash dash type, in our case here, named the underscore cache underscore t, which is then applied to var named the zone, or should be zone file.db, not whatever I wrote there. Another way to restore the correct label is to ask the policy uh, what label should be on a file and then automatically relabel the file. And that can be done with the command restoreCon. So restoreCon does both the matchCon operation and the changeCon operation in one step. Here, restoreCon is being applied to var namedy namedy localhost. And it tells us that it relabeled that file from system u object r etsy underscore t to system u object r name d underscore zone underscore t. If we want to store the bind files on a non standard location outside var name d, for example, and I often store my zone files on a dedicated authoritative name server under SRV bind or SRV named. It's required to change the policy so that the SE Linux policy knows that all files in that hierarchy of the file system should belong to the bind server. And we do that with the command se manage f context for file context, minus a for add, minus t for type, name d underscore zone underscore t is the type. And then we specify the full path of the file that should have the new type. That will not automatically relabel the file. And we can use restore con to then relabel the files that are stored in that location. However, doing that for every single file is quite tedious. So we can change the, um, um, the policy with kind of glob operators that will automatically apply a wildcard to certain hierarchies of the file system. And here I'm applying the type named the zone T to all the files and all the directories under SRV bind zones because that is where I want to store my zone files and the type named the conf t to all the files that are under SRV bind conf, which are then all the configuration files. The SA Linux modules can be tweaked with the help of Boolean switches. And we can list all the switches that are available in our, in our SE Linux system with the command get se pool, uh, sorry, get se bool minus a for all. And that will list a long list of all the Boolean switches that can be used to switch on or off certain behavior. There are two switches that are in, of interest for the bind users, which is the named TCP bind HTTP port and the named write master zones. So the first one, named the TCP bind HTTP port, controls if bind can uh, open a socket to an HTTP port. And that is being used for the statistics channel. So the default configuration that you often find in tutorials on the internet is to bind the statistics channel on port 8053. And 80 comes from port 80 of HTTP and 53 is the, the DNS port. So combining both together gives us 8053. Now, if you just copy and paste such a configuration from a tutorial or from the internet in a Red Hat based system and start your bind server, it will not work. You will see a policy uh, violation. And if you try to reach your uh, bind server with a web browser, you will see that you get a non-loading page. 
reason here is that by default, the SC Linux policy forbids bind to open a port other than port 53. And we can allow a bind to open a port, a different port, by switching the Boolean switch, named the TCP bind HTTP port. And we do that with set as eBool, name of the Boolean variable, equals on. However, port 8053 is not among the ports that are allowed. We can list the allowed ports with the se manage port uh, command port minus L for list ports. And then we search for HTTP underscore port underscore T. And we see that port 80, 81, 443, 488, 8008, 8009, 8443, and 9000 are allowed, but not 8053. There are now two solutions to this problem. Solution A is to use a port that is already permitted by HTTP port T, such as 8008, and that works quite good. Solution B is to add a new port, the port that we want to have, port 8053, to the definition of HTTP underscore port underscore, uh, underscore T. And we do that with the command se manage port minus A for at minus T for the type, and then minus P for the port with the transport protocol uh, prepended, so TCP AD53. And now port AD53 is enabled for all applications that have a permission for HTTP port T, which includes the bind server, but also includes Nginx and the Apache web server and possibly a lot of other applications. The other Boolean switch is the named write master zones. And with that, we can control whether bind nine are permitted or is permitted to write the zone files. On Red Hat Enterprise Linux systems, um, that is permitted by default. On Debian system, it's off by default. It is required by secondary servers because secondary servers, they write the zone files, but also for dynamic zones because on an primary server, dynamic zones will be rewritten by the bind process. If you run an authoritative server with purely static zones, so zones that you just manage with an editor, you can switch that toggle switch to off and enhance the security by doing that. Because now the bind nine process will not be able to mess around with your zone files. So that was the overview of um, SA Linux. Here are some additional resources. The brief tour of Linux security modules that I mentioned before. Um, there is a good blog article um, on some problems that SE Linux created for the bind startup between uh, different uh, Linux kernel versions. I think it was between uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 and 7 changes being there. Um, a link to some background information on the Linux kernel audit system that is being used by SE Linux and a link to an online version of the uh, SE Linux uh, bind man page. The man page on your system might be more up to date, but if you don't want to go through the hassle of installing all the dependencies of the policy development tools for SA Linux, you can find most of the information on that web page here as well. Which brings us to the list of next webinars. SA Linux is just one of multiple Linux security modules, and in the next um, webinar, which will be in October 20th, we look at some of the other Linux security modules. We look at UpArmor. Uh, we also look at FireJail, which is not only a security module, but a whole uh, containerization system for containerization of um, um, uh, applications. And we look at CCOMP BPF, what that is. It's a firewall for system calls and how we can utilize CCOMP BPF uh, with bind and systemd.
Then in November, we talk about instrumenting bind nine uh, with BCC uh, B eBPF, which is the new technology in the Linux kernel to really be able to look into a running process uh, to make performance observation, but also security observation. And we cover both the performance and the security with a focus on the bind nine name server. And then on December, we will talk about DNS fragmentation, about some real world measurements and the impact of DNS fragmentation of bind security. And with that, do we have any questions? So Kirsten, we have a couple of questions. Um, I'm also going to put up a uh, just a quick poll uh, asking people how useful this was. Uh, feel free to just uh, fill that in uh, while we're doing the questions. Um, so the first uh, two questions are from Rick. Uh, what's the benefit of labeling the port HTTP underscore port T and enabling the Boolean instead of adding port 8053 to the list of SE Linux named ports? Um, yeah, this is really depending on how you run your systems uh, and whether other applications are um, on, the machine, on the system. Um, that are, are using HTTP port T. So the designers of the SE Linux uh, policy that is running on Reddit systems uh, created this, um, this Boolean which that it is able to quite with low effort to, to enable bind to uh, listen on these additional ports, the ports that are defined for uh, web servers. So that is a low effort work to do and adding the port to either name the port T or um, adding a different port to HTTP port T is extra work, um, requires a change of the, the policy itself and might not be permitted in some situations. So I would say there's maybe not a big difference between uh, labeling the port and um, using the Boolean. It's just less work. And in some cases it's, um, um, easier to do and even the only version permitted in that environment. Okay, so uh, follow-up question um, also from Rick, uh, why use httpd underscore port t and not dns port t for the statistics channel? So we really have to ask the people who wrote the uh, uh, SE Linux policy at Red Hat um, about that. But my guess would be that the statistics channel is a web server. So it is HTTP. So because of that, they used HTTP D port T instead of DNS port and DNS port is uh, reserved for the DNS protocol itself. That is port 53 and maybe a DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTPS, of all the letter would be <laughs> just in between of that. Okay, so the last question I see here is from Michael. Uh, he's asking what versions of Red Hat, uh, I, so I think, you know, what version of Red Hat are your examples from? What version of Red Hat supports this? Yeah, I'm using here Red Hat 8, so CentOS 8 and Alma Linux 8 and Rocky Linux 8 should be the same. It's also available I think with a quite uh, similar functionality in, in CentOS 7 or Red Hat 7. I'm not sure about Red Hat 6. I have not worked with Red Hat 6 for many, many years and haven't looked into that lately. Uh, but it should work the way how, how I presented that on 8 and also on 7. Okay, that's it for the questions. Uh, I see some other questions in the um, in the chat. Should I also cover that? So I see Anthony asking here, um, having a Debian Ubuntu server, is it a good idea to install SA Linux? Uh, depends. Um, if your application that you want to secure are um, subject of the basic um, uh, policy that ships with Debian and Ubuntu systems, yes. If not, it's better to use the other security modules such as AppArmor, which are better maintained on Debian and Ubuntu systems. 
And now I think that's the last question. <laughs> Good. So uh, I've prepared um, um, the hands-on session. Oops. And let me quickly go 